All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Mr. RJ Parrish. RJ, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Scott. Yeah, yeah. I've been actually I've been wanting to kind of sit down with you for a while, so I'm glad we were finally able to make this happen. Um, so I'll just kind of jump into things here. You grew up in Bark River. Um, when you think back on that, what are like some key memories that that stick out to you? Oh man, uh, yeah, metro area of Bark River. You know. Uh, <laughs> Suburban for, those who, for those who don't know, yeah, exactly. For those that don't know, I mean, it's a caution light town with like a thousand people across maybe 20 square miles. It's tiny. And for the most part, growing up there, I had just the one thought of, I am not going to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> I, a lot of people have that about their hometowns. It wasn't a bad place, but I knew it was not where I wanted to stay. Sure. There, you know, there were only a few places most people could work. Right. And it wasn't, I wanted something more. I had the thought I was going to leave the UP in general, but sure. then Marquette kind of, it pulled me in and <laughs> here we that, are. That's fair. All of my, like, all of my memories growing up that I have of Bark River, uh, all related around football. You know, my, my dad was the head football coach for North Dickinson and so they, you know, they were in the same class, so they played each other in football. So like all of my memories are pretty much like traveling with the team, you know, Friday nights and going to a football game. And, and so like, when I think of Park River, I just associate it with football for some reason, but <laughs> that's fair. fair. There's not a lot else there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I know you ended up in Marquette, but when you finished high school, you did a couple of years at Bay, correct? I did. I okay. did one year at Bay after high school, and I did a year dual enrolled in my senior year. Okay, cool. Uh, they, they had the option, and it was that or have kind of this weird dead time and for the price, and it, it just was great to be able to get some of the intro-level courses, English, like algebra, the stuff yeah. I was going to have to take no matter what. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I would have to take those. So and I got them out of the way, and at the time, the I don't remember if it was for Delta County residents or Michigan residents, but to take a class at Bay, it was like $99 per credit hour. Wow. Where at the time, for Northern, it was like $3.99 a credit hour. So it just, knowing that there were some courses that I would have to take no matter what, and I knew that most of them would transfer, if not all of them, like I, I just, it was a no-brainer to get some of it out of the way. Yeah, I mean... Well, first off, the dual enrollment thing is super cool because, I mean, if you can, can take advantage of that, why would you not? But you hit, you hit on a, a perfect point about, like, just the, the dollar value there that I think a lot of kids, like, don't realize. Like, yeah. I loved my experience in college, like, all four years. But, like, looking back as, like, an adult now, like, from a dollars and cents standpoint, I wish I had done what you had done and, and gotten that out of the way at, at bay. Yeah. Um, yeah, your first year, you're, I mean, the entry level courses are not going to be the foundational memories that you have from college. So if you can get them out of the way and so you can actually focus on a lot of the great things that college can bring, you know, relationships and, uh, and joining groups and clubs and like being a part of campus and not have to worry about like English 111, <laughs> that is huge. For sure, for sure. Um, so what, what really was it about then that Marquette and Northern that kind of lured you up there? I came up on a field trip in high school, like sophomore year as a backup, as a stand in for a backup on the quiz bowl team. It was that <laughs> morning. I, I kid you not. It was that morning. I wasn't on the team and like their backup, their second backup, like had to cancel for some reason. And they just <laughs> looked at me and like, you want to go? I'm like, yeah, obviously. So I just, I grabbed everything and like they said, they'd tell my teachers that I was gone for the day and I hopped on the bus and we took the ride up to Marquette. We got into the LRC parking lot, the library parking lot. And I'd never seen campus before. And it was just like, it must've been springtime or maybe, maybe it was like August or something early in the year. I don't know, but campus was gorgeous. It was green, like people, it was like the arriving to college scene in sure. movies <laughs> yeah <laughs> like people with backpacks they're like smiling at each other and like going down the the walkway and I walked in and they had a Starbucks which was like 
we had nothing like that in Bark River. Like this was crazy. And I just decided, I don't know why. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get here, but I'm coming here. <laughs> I, beyond that, I had no plan. And then it just so happened as I figured out the program I was going to study, Northern had it and it just, it clicked. Sure. sure. And speaking of the program that you decided to study, if I'm, if I'm correct, it was psychology. Is that what you ended up studying? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So what, what kind of, what kind of led you down that path? I, at the time growing up and through much of college, I was extremely introverted and I didn't understand people. And I didn't go into the program with the idea that I was going to, it, I wasn't drawn to therapy or counseling or, or any of that. It wasn't the activity. It was the, I wanted to understand people. Why do they do what they do? And hopefully I'd be able to connect better with them. And I would unlock the thing that I was missing. And as it would, as you'd have it, most psych students are not the most extroverted of people. <laughs> Their interactions are like one way glass and like questionnaires. And so I got into the program like this is not at all what I thought. I thought these were going to be like, you know, people maestros and like masters of charisma. Not the case. <laughs> so along the way, I, I went into the program. It was great. I, I learned a ton and I had, built the plan of becoming a psychiatrist because it kind of aligned with, with that and I'd be able to help people and it was appealing to be able to like diagnose people's problems and like help them live a better life. And somewhere along the way, I was in organic chemistry, taking a physics course. I was on track to go to medical school and I woke up in a, like a panic, like, how did I get here? This is not what I signed up for. I hate these classes. This is miserable. I ran to the registrar and like, please help me fix this. I have a chemistry minor for some reason and I don't, this is not what I want. And I completely pivoted. I had ended up in the neuroscience program and I pulled out of that, went into general psych and uh, got a, mar a marketing minor. And that was kind of a big shift moment because I kind of flashed forward of like, if I stay on this, I'm not going to be happy. I might be successful. I might make money and do all that stuff, but like, it isn't what I want to do. And I'm going to be in school until I'm 30, 31, 32 with a ton of debt. Sure. Not the path. Like I looked down that path and it wasn't for me. So I kind of switched gears, focused more on consumer behavior and marketing and why do people buy what they buy sure. and shifted more into that avenue. Well, and kudos to you for having that foresight. I mean, how many people probably between the two of us we could count that went through school and really got a degree that they weren't super wild about because they felt like they were in too deep in it. And like you said, you end up with a ton of debt. You might, you might be successful career wise, but you're not exactly super happy with the choice that you made, you know, looking back. And a lot of times hindsight's 2020, but yeah, it's not easy to make the decision that you made. So I, I give you major props for that. Um, so, you know, I kind of consider you like a, 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 a jack of all trades, um, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, but you're primarily kind of a filmmaker. Um, you know, how did really like the filmmaking piece kind of come into all of that? I mean, I know you kind of started to touch on that a little bit about like, you know, why consumers purchase what they purchase, but how did that kind of snowball into to all the film work that you've been doing? Yeah. So before I, chose psych as my my go-to originally like the first thing the first actual career path that I thought this was probably like early teens 13 14 years old that I thought that maybe I could do maybe I maybe I could enjoy was making movies and there was just this kind of draw I didn't know what part of making movies I just knew that of the things that I loved enough that I'd want to do it every day being involved in that seemed like something that could be really cool. But at okay. the time, the industry was like, you had to live in New York or LA. Full stop, there, was no, there were, was no other options. You had to know a director or a producer. You had to go to film school. And I didn't do any of those things and I didn't know any of those people. <laughs> so I, that was pretty much like, I just assumed it was dead, like it would never happen. So I didn't pursue that, that route. And then I went to, to Northern for Psych and 
then I came into marketing and then the industry had kind of started to change where video production wasn't this big business thing anymore. Like anyone could do it. You know, pe anyone with a smartphone could in theory make a video. And uh, near the end of my college career, I got an internship with a company called Carlson Media. And Carlson Media was a, it was a digital marketing agency. So along the way, there were a couple of clients who we thought video would be hugely beneficial for them. We pitched them a couple ideas and we just kind of, we didn't know what we were doing. We filmed a couple uh, cocktail videos for a restaurant called Iron Bay <laughs> and they loved them. They weren't horrible. And it was this weird like meeting of my past self with like my current self. Like I wanted to do something like this. And this is, this is kind of a way for me to do that. It's far from a movie, but like I can kind of do a little bit of that and apply it and like make money. So we started doing more projects and pitching more video. And I kind of became the video guy at Carlson Media. And over time, I you know tried other things. I shot weddings and events and uh, did some commercial stuff and real estate and filmed my own personal stuff just because I wanted to do it. And over time, I just started to get enough skill and people started to know me for that, that eventually I pivoted to that full time. Yeah. Well, and uh, so you started at Carlson with an internship and then that just kind of like transitioned into like a full-time job right out of school. Am I understanding that right? Kind of. Uh, kind of? I'm, <laughs> I, I got the internship while in school and it was, okay. uh, it was like the, November I graduated in May of 2017 so I think it was like December 2016 I got the internship and I offered to work for free until it made sense to hire me sure and I realized like that isn't like always a smart way to do things for everyone it depends sure. <laughs> on the situation but like I have given the advice before of like if there's somewhere that you resonate with of someone who you could see wanting to work for or work with like provide value and then you, know, you can set kind of a a timetable you're comfortable with 90 days six months a year whatever and then at the end of that like either you have a job or you leave and it worked out that the over about those six months uh the business grew enough that it could hire me on as its first employee that's pretty cool. Um, I would agree with you that that probably wouldn't work for everybody in all instances. <laughs> right. But if, like you said, if the relationship is there with, with that person that you want to work with, which obviously you had enough of a rapport there with Justin that, that you wanted to kind of see where it led. Um, so um, while you were working there, were you just primarily kind of the film guy or were you working for like kind of working on other stuff with them too? I mean, I know it's a pretty small kind of boutique type of business for lack of a better word, where were you kind of involved in all aspects? It was definitely all over the place. Uh, being it was, you know, it was, at first it was just the two of us and then other people came on over time, but it first as an intern, there was this kind of like, I was, an unpaid intern. So there wasn't a lot of structure. It was more like, well, find what you want to do and then like practice that and do it. And then, sure, <laughs> you know, like it yeah. will kind of, you know, like I appreciate the help where, where I can get it. And that was anything from you know, managing social media to writing out proposals to like doing some outreach to photography to like, it was just all over the place. So I got to taste a lot of things without a lot of risk to me. And I had kind of the, the backing of being a young guy with another, you know, a young business owner. And we we're these kind of like upstarts a little bit. Sure. And we we're, we we're kind of, you know, setting our own path and trying to do things our way. And over time, we just kind of figured things out. We did a lot wrong on the way and <laughs> a lot of learning, a lot of, you know, making things work. And over time, I settled more into managing ad campaigns through like Facebook and Instagram and then pairing that with like photo and video as the sure. content to drive them. Okay. 
So I, I know you were there for like probably a little over a year and then you really took a leap and decided to venture out on your own, which has got to be kind of, you know, a scary, like big life moment. What, like, can you walk me through like what led to that transition? Like how that all came about? Yeah. I think I was there for, it was like 18 months or so. Yep. Uh, yeah. Something, like six, something 16, around there. Yeah. I think it was like, at least in my, my, uh, investigation. Whatever LinkedIn says. Call it that. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> it was like maybe like 16 or 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. So something like that over there was kind of, kind of two parts to it. One was like, as I became the video guy and I was really the only one uh, running that side of the business, there were things that came along that didn't really fit within the scope of the company. Things like weddings. Sure. You know, we, we had some conversations of, are we a wedding videography business? And like, we're like, we could be, but like that wouldn't make any sense. We're a marketing business. So I started doing some weddings on the side and then, you know, I, I kind of got it in my head of eventually I'm going to want to do this for myself. Like I, I had enough knowledge. I didn't know. I thought I knew way more than I actually did at the time, but I had gotten enough uh, kind of steam going that I felt I could, I could make a run of it. But then there led to when I actually did go full time, it was kind of like I'd built some, a little bit of something for myself on the side, but then there were just some, some differences. There were some, some client things that fell through. And then that led to some decisions being made if the team got downsized. And I knew, I knew I had something kind of to fall back on a little bit. And it was just kind of this leaping off moment of like, I can either try and find a job or I can make a run for it and see what happens. And I'm going to give myself a year. And if I can, if I'm not sinking and like, in poverty and bankrupt, then like, <laughs> I'll keep going. And if everything is terrible, then I will go do something else. You know, I can go bartend, I can wait tables, I can do all the stuff I was doing before. Sure. So there was kind of this point of like, I had to know if I could do it. That's, that's got to be exciting <laughs> and also terrifying. <laughs> yeah. It all happened like right before the holidays which I do not recommend for anyone who's thinking about like leaving a job and starting a business. I would really recommend waiting until like May, June. I would not go in, I would not go into Christmas. Yeah. Do not go into like Thanksgiving (laughs) when all your family's like, so how's it going? You're like, I don't know how to do accounting. And (laughs) I have a, very few clients oh. right now. So <laughs> yeah, I, I would have more of a plan, but for those who are like really back against the wall, miserable, take a shot, you know? And like, oh. obviously if you've got a family and a mortgage and like that stuff, it's harder, but there are a lot of people in their like twenties or even thirties single. And like, they don't, they aren't tied down who could change everything pretty quickly. Sure. Well, and I love that, you know, like the, that you're really kind of like focusing on the, the filmmaking, you know, whether it is like a marketing piece or if it's something personal that you're working on. Um, I just feel like the UP needs more filmmakers. Um, you know, I, I talked with in season one, I talked with Jason Markstrom who runs the Sioux film festival. And one of the things that we talked about was, you know, haven't, you know, they get some, you know, like UP submissions, but obviously they could use a heck of a lot more, you know? So anybody that's, even if you're just doing something small, like marketing or filming with your buddies, or you've got a YouTube channel, like the more filmmaking that's going on, I feel like the better is kind of my take on it. I don't know your thoughts on that, but. Yeah. I, I think filmmaking can get like a lot of, even me who, who I've been doing like the act of it for the last few years, it can feel kind of stuffy a little bit. Like there's some circles that are like, it's this very structured, like you're filming documentaries and short films and like running a crew. And it's like usually with like little to no budget and you're trying to make it work. And there's this like starving artist trope. And I don't 
really identify with that because I maybe because of how I learned was be, by applying it to business rather than like learning the art and trying to sell it. I think there's kind of a different, uh, different path there, sure. but absolutely. Like I think video and film and whatever you want to call it is the best medium to communicate something, whether that's for a business, whether that's just for yourself to capture memories, there's no better way to relive something than to watch it actually happen. Photos are great, scrapbooks and all that stuff is great. But being able to watch important moments, that there's nothing better. Sure. You know, simple stuff that isn't important to us right now in 10, 15, 20, 50 years, absolutely will be. Right, right. Do you, do you find yourself sticking to like what you're good at and focusing on your strengths or do you find yourself trying to experiment and maybe work on some different things and like challenging yourself to, to kind of try and try and get better? It's a good question. I am not naturally skilled at a lot of things. Okay. Most of what I've, what I've gotten good at, there's some tendencies that have kind of helped me lean into certain areas, but from a skill development standpoint, like I've had to work at pretty much all of it. Sure. So I think of like the jack of all trades thing. I think we as people are different at different stages in our lives. And as we have bigger challenges or different challenges, we need different skill sets to be able to address them. So I think only knowing a couple of things puts you in a pretty small box to play in. Sure. Where if you have a broader skill set that you learn kind of over time as you're, as things progress, then I think it gives you a, a better toolkit to, to grow and to overcome new challenges. I think also by nature of, you know, neuroplasticity, this concept that our brains are never done growing and sure. learning things and viewing the world in different ways helps us solve problems in and make connections that we wouldn't otherwise. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, coming from a, a teaching background, we always talked about lifelong learners. You know, you, you never stop learning. Yeah. So it, it's, it's real easy to let rest on your laurels sometimes, but I, I'm also, I'm, I'm right there with you on continuing to explore and, and, and push yourself. But I also, I don't know if, if you do this, but I tend to also kind of struggle with that sometimes because I want to learn so much about so many different things that I almost get myself overwhelmed. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, just for example, it's like, okay, I wrote, wrote a children's book and I did that for a while. And then it's like, well, maybe I want to write a novel. Well, then it's like, okay, well then now I want to do a podcast. So I start learning about that. And it's like, I've got too many pots on the stove, you know, at, at one time. And, and then I just like, I either burn myself out or I just get like overwhelmed that I don't even know where to start. I mean, I don't know if you can relate to that at all, but. <laughs> yes, very much so. I think information overload is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people don't start something. Sure. Or they, they may start and it, it kind of putters out pretty quickly. Yeah. And I, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, whenever you just consume without a plan, I try and approach it from the perspective of what do I need to know now? Like oh, in the next six to 12 months, what are the most important things for me to know? And sometimes I am good about it and other times I'm terrible in that I'm learning things that are either moving me through that or it's just like, yeah, well, it's cool that I now know, I don't know, you know, like how to solder, but like it, I'm not going to use it a lot in my day to day right. life. Right. You know, like sometimes I get in the kick of, I want to learn a language and like, I'll pick something brand new up just to like, see if I suddenly understand Mandarin. And <laughs> usually very quickly I realize like, this is not going to be practical. Sure. You know? Knowledge is not power. Being able to apply knowledge is powerful. Sure. And a lot of people just accumulate knowledge and don't really do anything with it. I, yeah, I, that's, that's a, definitely a good point and an interesting way to think about it. Um, 
one of the things that I appreciate about, about your film work and a lot of the stuff that you do kind of on the personal side of things is that you're definitely not afraid to get in front of the camera yourself. Um, you know, whether you're just trying to start a dialogue or, or you're voicing your opinion on something. And I feel like a lot of people that would be difficult to do because it, you're really kind of putting yourself out there and making yourself vulnerable. Um, I, I'm guessing if you were introverted growing up, that's probably been a work in progress for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know how many, but I'm pretty sure there are sitting somewhere in my hard drives, just like hours of me trying to talk to a camera. And it's just like me, like opening my mouth, like a fish, like just <laughs> nothing happening. Just like shaking in a room alone like trying to get something out and then maybe I'll start and then it like trails off. It was absolutely not something that came naturally. It usually I I'm better now. It's something you get better with the more you do it. And the more you realize that it isn't about talking to a camera, it's just talking to other people with a delay right now you and I are speaking and there's no delay talking to just the camera, there's just a pause between someone gets to see it. Right. That's all, that's the only difference. But when you bring in lights and a camera and a microphone, people treat it differently. You're just talking to people and usually only one at a time. Maybe you've got a big audience. Maybe it's going to be in an ad campaign that a lot of, a lot of people will see. That's not how it's consumed. You know, the, the numbers freak people out of a thousand people saw this. Oh my God. Right. Well, not all at once. Like maybe two people watched it side by side. Yeah. Like maybe nobody is yeah. putting you in a theater, <laughs> you know, and we, we get in our own heads of being judged and being perceived differently or realistically, everybody has their own thing. They don't care nearly as much as people think they do. I, I would agree with you completely. It, you've got me thinking back to the, the early days of the podcast. And when I record my intros and my outros, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not talking to you. I'm sitting in a room by myself, just recording it. And man, for the quite a while with those first couple of episodes, I was like, had to do a million takes. And I was so like dissecting everything I was saying. And then I'm like writing stuff down and I'm trying not to make it sound like I'm reading off of a script. And it was just like, it took time, but eventually I just kind of got the hang of sitting there and talking as if somebody's in the room with me, but it, it definitely took, <laughs> took major, major practice to, to, to get there. But I so relate to, to the like worrying about, you know, what, what, what are people going to think? And, and like you said, you, you like picture in your head, like you're up on some like big screen in a theater or something, something crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's easier said than done, right? Like it, it's easy yeah. to say, you know, for I've done it many times and it's not that I don't still get nervous sometimes. Like if I need to script something, I usually it's like same thing. I'm, it's like maybe two or three takes if I'm lucky. Other times like a dozen and by the end I'm like, enough is enough and I like freestyle it <laughs> and you just have to know yourself of why are you doing it in the first place and if it's just if it's from a you know getting a message out there or you're trying to share knowledge or you're trying to communicate something that you want out in the world you need to decide what's more important how you think you're being perceived or what you're trying to do for other people yeah. You know, for, for a, a business owner who's afraid of how they're going to be perceived, well, is that really the priority or is it more important that you get your message to the people who need to hear it? And I, I think there's, a once you have that degree of selflessness, if it's not about you, it becomes a lot easier. Yeah, I, I, I definitely hear you there. Um, a lot of what, at least on your, your personal page or the personal stuff you end up working on, a lot of what you talk about is motivation or self-improvement, that type of stuff. What, who or what kind of inspires you, you know, with, with what you do what, every day? What, where, where do you draw that inspiration from? 
It's a great question. I, I talk about, I try not to be um, like motivational because I think motivation is kind of cheap. Well, you motivate me and put the light. I appreciate that. Crazy. You, you motivate me. <laughs> cool. I, <laughs> I try to, not that I, I feel that I'm like this inspiring person, you know, I'm not out climbing mountaintops and like, right. you know, out living my best life. But like, there's a degree of the older I got, the more I realized how self-conscious almost everyone is, regardless of how perfect things look on the outside, there's usually something going on that they are struggling with. And once I started to realize that, wait a minute, it isn't just me. It isn't just me that has you know, some insecurities or anxiety or any of these things, it's everyone. And once I started to internalize that, I realized like, okay, well, if I can get over some of those things, if I can go from being extremely introverted to now being like competently extroverted, <laughs> I'm still not like, I'm not going to run a room and like charm the crowd, but there's a degree of like, I can get out and engage with people and not be afraid to talk to a human being. If I can make that progress and so can other people. And there's this kind of, acceptance that we have a limited amount of time in life to do the things we want to do and way too many people wait way too long and then it's just regret that just weighs on them and i like that's my biggest fear so trying to like i saw it with my career path if i knew i wouldn't be happy being a doctor and i see it with a lot of other people living their lives if you are not happy now that is not going to change on its own you need to do something you enjoy you need to do what you want to do, what you were meant to do, however you want to look at it. And you can't wait. You're capable of doing it. You're better than you think you are. And there's very little stopping you once you actually decide to do something. Amen. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're preaching to the choir. Like I said, you think you're not motivating, but you're motivating me. I like, you know, when you, when you talk about that kind of stuff, it's like, I don't know. I, I, you're checking off all the boxes. You're saying it, <laughs> you're saying it and approaching it in a way that's relatable. You're not coming off as preachy, but you're also saying it in a way that I would say it myself if I was talking to somebody. So I think that's why I relate to it so much. Um, to transition a little bit, I want to talk about lucid coast. I mean, so you, you branch off on your own, you, you know, you're, you're filmmaking, you're marketing, you're doing all of this stuff. How did everything with, with Lucid Coast come together? Yeah, very similar to how I kind of got started with Carlson Media. I, I met Keith uh, a few years prior to uh, joining the company. I met him two, three years ago. He was the keynote speaker at a, a College of Business conference at Northern. I was, I believe I was a like a, a secondary speaker like I, I had a little session and then he was the keynote and I went and I saw this guy who was like he did all of these cool things you know, he worked at IBM he lived in New Zealand for a while he went he traveled all over the place had a family was a surfer and the UP it was like who is this guy and at the time I was kind of at the kind of a growing stage where I was still pretty introverted I, I didn't really I mean, introverted, introverted in a way that I was comfortable enough to give a talk to 40 students or something, but I'd made a, a decision at lunch that I wasn't just going to sit alone and leave. I was going to go talk to the keynote and he turned out to be this super cool guy and it kind of was this boost. And then over time, we just kept in touch. I would watch what he was doing and he was doing all this crazy stuff of, you know, working to create the Cybersecurity Institute and doing projects with IBM and HackerOne and the Coder Dojo. And he, it seemed like he was doing all of this stuff to create a better community, to increase opportunity, to bring in new jobs, to offer internships. And I saw him as the kind of person that I, I knew that even if we didn't work together directly, I knew we were going to run in similar circles. Like we were, sure. if I was going to stay here, we were going to bump into each other. And then as Lucid Coast started to kind of gain some traction and he focused more of his time there, 
uh, there came an opportunity uh, earlier this year, earlier this year, where we had a conversation of, would it make more sense for me to be a subcontractor to work and do some media production and tell the story of this thing that he's building, or would it make more sense for me to just come on board full time? And I had run, I'd run along and like done the full time videography thing for the, about 18 months and it had ups and downs but there was kind of reaching a point where I really wanted some stability like something solid to stand on for a couple months a year a couple years and like if it worked out then maybe there's somewhere I could just kind of plant roots and help to sure. grow something that's bigger than just me yeah and uh, he made an offer I accepted and then like the week after the world shut down <laughs> So it made for a very interesting uh, onboarding and, you know, working for someone again, but right. it's well, been, it's been really good. <laughs> well, if anybody listening into this is like hearing all this stuff about Keith and they're like, man, I got to hear more about this guy. Go back to season one and listen to my interview with Keith. He's a friend of the podcast. So shout out to Keith. He's a great guy and he's got an awesome story, but um it's just crazy the that you're you're hired basically kind of right as the pandemic is is hitting and and I want to talk to you a little bit more about that but for those that might not be aware because I'm sure there's some that that don't know what exactly is Lucid Coast if you were going to describe to somebody what what this this business is yeah so there's a couple different arms of the business it's an innovations company and it's built on the idea of creating opportunities and leveraging technology to start and grow businesses. Now that's this big kind of conglomerated mess. So it breaks down into a few pieces. The first part is a managed services business of providing IT and technology services to existing companies under the idea that technology is meant to help. And a lot of times, we have too many tools for a small number of things and it gets in our way more often than not. Your internet isn't working, your phone systems are down, your sales system is down. These things that are basically like ad administrative fires that are preventing you from doing the thing you actually got into business to do. Sure. Lucid Coast eliminates that. Manage your, those services for you so you can actually focus on things that actually matter. Ideally, you never have to worry about IT. And if that isn't the case, then you should probably do something about that. Yeah. <laughs> the other side of the business is trying to create new opportunities, working with startups and business founders to bring ideas into the marketplace, to make opportunities, to create new jobs, to hopefully make the world, the UP, our community, and people's lives better. That can be a lot of different things, but we work with companies to take them through a startup process and by the end they'll take it their idea and hopefully be ready for the market that's super exciting like that a company like this exists in the upper peninsula i mean if you think back like even just five years ago or 10 years ago like the thought of a company like this existing and 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 thriving in the up you would just be like no like no <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I very, it feels very nostalgic to when I was looking at like film and realizing like, I don't want to live in LA. I don't want to go to Hollywood. I don't want that life. Very similar. A lot of people who have an app idea where, you know, they want to start a, a software business or they want to start a product. You don't have to go to Silicon Valley. In fact, it probably is better that you don't. Is there infrastructure there and, you know, VC opportunities? Sure. But there's also a million other people with ideas that you're competing with. Here, you don't have a million people. You've got maybe, you know, a dozen, two dozen, a right. hundred, you know, like it's much, much smaller. And the infrastructure is not there yet, but it's growing. Like you said, five years ago, there was nothing. I was here five years ago. I remember yeah. like there's very little happening. Yeah. And now there's this movement of we have multiple space companies coming to Marquette. They're based in Marquette. Like not one, multiple. There are people, you know, multiple 
apps and healthcare companies and you know these ideas coming and it's just the start. How many people are sitting out there who have an idea for a product, an app, uh, a platform, and they're sitting on it because like they don't know how to actually make it happen. They don't know how to code. They don't know how to get funding. But if they had someone who could work with them and you know work flesh that idea out and see if it's valid and then if it is help them run with it how many more awesome things could happen yeah absolutely and and i think what fits very hand in glove with that is that i know um you guys and by you guys i mean lucid coast is is very um tied in with the campfire co-working space so at, you know, as you're talking about all these different people with ideas and different companies and trying to get them off the ground and make them a reality, what better space to try and make that happen in than this kind of incubator of a co-working space with, with different, you know, ideas floating around and people working in, in, you know, a common area trying to help each other, you know, make that, make that dream come, become a reality. Absolutely. Environment is so key to everything. I mean, how many, for the last few months of how, when people were cooped up in their home, most people have everything they need to do a workout at home. Very few people have the discipline to. Right. <laughs> Same thing, it, like a gym, an office, uh, a, you know, whatever. It's very, very important to have the right atmosphere and the right people around to put you in that, in that space. And when the atmosphere is ideas, innovation, support, collaboration, you know, other people living that life, it just puts you in this headspace and this, it just, the energy is almost tangible and it's super exciting to be a part of. Obviously with the pandemic going on, a lot of that co-working type of thing is kind of, you know, on hold for the moment, but on the flip side of that, you know, what you're really talking about or, or, or what you, you know, in my opinion, you've really been getting at is leveraging technology. I feel like in this time of social distancing that we're, we're in, that really kind of puts you guys in a, in a unique spot to, to do some really special stuff. Because I mean, everybody right now is literally trying to leverage technology, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even from a, from a, adopting the ability to be able to pivot into new opportunities. I think there's even just that kind of mindset shift of people realize they were not as prepared to uh, work from home or to, you know, operate things remotely as they maybe thought they were. And now I think it's woken people up to things are changing and there's technology out there that can help, but you need to know how to use it. Right. You know, it, there's a, people have known that there was a shift coming for a long time. I don't think anyone planned on a pandemic making it, you know, that much quicker, but how many times have you gone to a, you know, maybe a doctor's office and the whole thing gets kind of steamrolled by a doctor not knowing how to use the computer? Right. <laughs> like there, there's this kind of like hesitancy to learn technology and to adopt it into processes of like, well, we've done that. We've done it this way for so long. Why would we change it? Right. Right. <laughs> well, there's a very good reason to change it and to become competent at it. You know, there, there are tools out there to make work efficient, to make companies run smoother, to take advantage of emerging trends and opportunities, but you have to be able to will, you have to be willing to go after them. I would agree completely. It's been interesting. I mean, just how many people I've heard say that, you know, their, their bosses or their companies now are like, well, you know, this has really kind of taught us maybe we don't have to have every single person in the office and maybe working from home does just work better for some people, or maybe we have hybrid positions and we kind of create new opportunities out of this. So, you know, it's kind of like the, the necessity births, the the change it, it forces you to to kind of you know put your cards out there on the table it, it really <laughs> yeah absolutely but uh 
as far as the pandemic, uh, what, what else have you been doing to pass the time personally, besides just in the workspace? How, how have you been keeping sane in all of this? <laughs> oh, man, uh, I have leaned pretty heavily into really educating myself on a lot of not a lot, a lot of like ancillary topics to things that I've been a little bit weak at, you know, learning more of a foundational understanding of business. I didn't go to, I didn't have a business degree. I didn't really uh, have any actual studies in it. It was more like trial and error and like figuring things out on the fly and it worked well enough, but now to be able to help existing businesses and to serve at a higher level, I've worked really deep in my understanding rather than having like a this very like loosey goosey approach to like googling things before meetings and like trying to you know figure it out in the moment it you know like having a figure it out attitude is all well and good but i should also be competent enough uh to really understand what i'm talking about sure so that's been a big big part of it i can appreciate that um I've been kind of trying to do things like in a similar vein to that, just slowing down. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm especially in the summer, I'm a very busy social person and I've really kind of drawn, drawn in a lot more, you know, my circle's a lot smaller. Um, I've been reading a lot, a lot more. Um, just trying to really kind of, like you said, slow down and maybe work on some things that, that I'm, could improve on that that type of thing i guess if that's the best way to word it i don't don't know but um it's been very introspective i guess you could say that's good sometimes to just kind of like evaluate where you are and see like what we had this very like once in a lifetime thing well we'll see if it's once in a lifetime we're having a few months where things really slowed down and there wasn't really any you know, like you were kind of forced to have more time. And then it got a lot of people this chance to really like look at what they were doing. Like, is this what I'm happy with? Like, what do I need to change? And it's been so interesting watching how people came out the other side. And I, I'm like, I'm blown away by the number of people who said like what you just said of they got to slow down and they realized like I was going way too fast and doing way too much stuff like I really did not need to be doing and like I was way more stressed than I thought I was absolutely (laughs) (laughs) we get this we kind of trick ourselves in like I have to do all these things like when realistically like maybe 30 percent of it is what you actually need to do right the rest you've just kind of like kind of said yes to too many times and now you're kind of like, you think you're stuck. Right. Well, and now, now you get like a new set of stressors. Like I've been in the middle of planning, planning a wedding with my fiance. You, you're expecting your, your first child with your wife. I mean, that's gotta be, uh, I can't imagine what, what you you guys are going through with all of this in the middle of a, a pandemic. It's been weird. It's been really weird. <laughs> I mean, it's weird under normal circumstances. So like, I don't know what it would be like without all of the extenuating circumstances but like definitely weird probably easier than what you're going through honestly yeah like it, well, what, how planning a venue and all of those things like everything that would normally be booked all year got shifted to next year and now it's like where, where are you going to squeeze in right right well and we're we're supposed to be getting married at the end of October and we're, we're still, we we're going through with it as of right now, whether wow. it's 10 people or 50 people we're we're, we're gung ho, but my fiance and I were very much planners. And so we find the, we find peace in having everything like planned and, and laid out. Like, so we know what's going on and the pandemic is just putting a big question mark on everything. So then it just like adds to the, the, you know, the stress level. But yeah, I can imagine. But it's all right. Like I said, one way or another, we're, we're going to get married, even if it's just the two of us. I mean, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. But uh, yeah, I, I've hit everything that I really wanted to <laughs> chat with you about. Is there anything that, that you felt like I missed or anything else that you wanted to, to chop it up about? I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm here for, for anything you want to get out there. Man. 
I think I'll, I'll put this out. Whether you have an idea or a passion or something that you enjoy enough that you'd want to make a business around it, go after it. Find other people who have done something. It could be starting a YouTube channel, a podcast, writing a book, starting a brick and mortar store, an Etsy shop. Like there are so many things that people can do right now. And it's just like, there's so much out there. And it doesn't matter if you don't know everything, just dabble, try. Like find other people who have done something that you want to do and talk to them. Most are going to be willing to talk to you about it. And if you have an app or an idea, reach out to us and yeah. we'll be happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> that's great. No, that's, that's, that's some great parting thoughts. I, I agree with you completely. Um, I guess my one final question that I'll give you is the same one that I give everybody. And that's how do you like your pasty? Oh. Uh, ketchup. Yeah, ketchup? definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any, I, do you have any favorite spots in town? Oh man. Pasties are always this thing. Like I always enjoy them when I have them, but I always kind of like, I don't seek them out often. Okay. So I, I don't know. I'm not a, an avid pasty guy, but Laurie's does have some good pasties. Yeah. Yes, they do. It's also kind of hard to think about kind of in the summer, uh, at least for me, yeah. because it's such a like warm, hearty thing that for me, right. like, I get hankerings for them when the weather's cold, like fall through the winter. I'm like every so yeah. often I'm like, you know, I, I want a pasty, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Whenever it's 95, it's hard to want like two pounds of beef and potato. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Something that sticks to your rib a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, RJ, I can't thank you enough for sitting down and chatting with me. This has been really great. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. This has been awesome. Thanks for having me, Scott.